Hi, thanks for joining us today. If this ministry has impacted your life, we want to hear about it. You can send us your story at amen at vnchurch.com. Also, we would love if you would partner with us financially. You can go to vnchurch.com and click the Give Online or text your donation amount to 757-230-2110. Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always, to the very end of the age. Will you accept the challenge to share his love, take next steps to discover power and to pass down a legacy that changes the world. Accept the challenge. Hey, isn't it awesome to laugh at church? Yeah, it's a great feeling. Well, I'm so glad you guys are here with us today. Who's ready for a good message? Woo! I hope it's good because I just hyped it up. All right, so... Um, we are starting a brand new summer series, a four-part series called Accept the Challenge, where we're going to look at the Great Commission. This is one of the last things that Jesus tells his disciples. Check this out, Matthew 28, it says this, Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me, therefore go. And I want you to highlight that part right there, therefore go, all right? Therefore, go make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit and teaching them to obey everything I've commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. What a challenge. What a challenge Jesus says. It's kind of like Jesus knew he was about to ascend to heaven and he looked at his disciples and he was kind of like, um, guys, I'm about to head out. So I'm going to need you to step your game up, all right? I'm going to need you guys to start being me to the world. And they're like, oh, Jesus, how are we supposed to do this, okay? So, so we're going to go over four challenges that we find from the Great Commission. But today we're going to highlight this challenge of go. Jesus says go, okay? And he believes in us to go. So if you are taking notes or following along on your outline or even following along on social media, you can title part one of this series, Who? Me? Who? Me? Like God wants to use me? Now, I have a question for you. Have you ever been challenged to do something that you didn't think you could do? Or have you ever accepted a challenge of something that you're like, why did I accept the challenge to do that? I'm not going to be able to do it. See, Aaron and I had our first, Aaron, my wife, Aaron and I had our, had our first real challenge as parents recently, okay? We had our first real challenge, and it was, the, it was involving a medical challenge involving our little girl, Kingsley, okay? And Kingsley, who's our beautiful, now 10-week-old, perfect, my baby's better than your baby daughter. <laughs> I'm joking. Your baby's cool, too. Okay. <laughs> so anyways... Kings, our little girl, was having a hard time gaining weight, okay? So our pediatrician told us that the reason for this is because she has a tongue tie and a lip tie, okay? Which is causing her to have a hard time latching on. She's burning a lot of energy while she's eating. And our pediatrician told us the only way to handle this is if Kingsley gets plastic surgery. And we're like, what? What do you mean plastic surgery? She's only this big. You know, what are you talking about? So we're freaking out, okay? So, but we trust our pediatrician's advice. She tells us about this plastic surgeon that she really recommended for us to go. So we're like, all right, doc, we, we trust you. We're going to go, okay? So, so we set up the appointment. Um, we get to the place. And up to this point, every hospital, you know, doctor's place that we have to take Kingsley to, the place is normally filled with colorful characters all over the wall and, and, and bright colors and bright lights and the sound of children laughing in the background. This place, not so much. We pulled up and it was raining outside and somehow this place is responsible for that. <laughs> then we walked into the place. It was dimly lit, looked like an asylum. Then we go into the waiting room and I know I'm a pastor. I'm not supposed to talk about people, but everyone in this room looked really strange. 
I'm like, man, where are we? I was expecting children and parents, and this is not what I see. Okay, so, so I'm kind of freaking out. I'm a little nervous about this challenge that I had to accept to do this for my daughter, to make sure that she's better. So, so finally, they take us into the back room, and I'm like, okay, this is going to be better. You know, I'm going to meet the doctor. It's going to be way better. And I can't make this up, okay? As they take us into the back room, I'm walking towards the, the procedure room. I'm holding the car seat with my seven-week-old daughter in, and I'm holding it. And as I'm walking down, on the walls, I can't make this up, on the walls are pictures of the best techniques to have breast implants. <laughs> Where am I taking my daughter right now? We get, so we get into the room, and from ceiling to floor, the wallpaper, which is already something, the wallpaper is covered with Moulin Rouge showgirls. And I'm like, I don't think this is the place that I should be right now. And so Aaron has Kingsley, like, holding in the corner. She ain't, ain't going to let no one touch my daughter in this place. And so we look at each other, and we're like, hey, we got to go. We got to get up out here. And before we get up out, the doctor comes busting in the room with his whole entourage. I'm, about, I'm talking about seven other student doctors with them. And this man had a deep South African accent. I tried to practice it for the message, but it didn't really work that well, so I just ain't going to do it. And, <laughs> and he was so eccentric, so charismatic, and he looked at us, and he instantly said, you guys are nervous, aren't you? And I'm like, just a little bit, you know, <laughs> just, you know. And then he said, don't worry. You, I mean, I really wanted to get that accent down. I couldn't. Okay, anyways, he said, don't worry. I'll show you what I'm going to do. So we take Kingsley. We put, we put her on the, on the table. He shows us what he's going to do. And then he finally he looks at me, and he's like this real eccentric, eccentric, eccentric man. They like really just sketchy, okay? And he looks at me, and he says, Dad, most parents want to leave during this portion. Do you guys want to go? And in my head, I said, hell no, nah, I ain't leaving you with my daughter. <laughs> but outside, I said, no, nah, I'm good. I'll be here. I'm straight. I'll watch. You know, I'm good. You know. And so, so anyways, I'm standing. He got me standing right next to him. He says, all right. I'm standing next to him. Aaron's in the corner kind of watching. And then he says, here it goes. And he takes out his surgical scissors. And then he lifts up her tongue. And he just cuts this big tongue tie. And she starts bleeding. I'm like, oh, my gosh. Okay. He's like, all right, that was the tongue. Now it's time for the lip. Okay. Then he lifts up her lip. And she has an even bigger tie on her lip. And he just cuts it. And she starts to bleed even more. Then the nurses are, like, putting all the things to stop the bleeding. And he's like, Dad, you did it. You made it through. And you look like you were unhinged. And outside, I was like, yeah, man, I trust you, Doc. It was fine the whole time. I'm good. But inside, I was like, Jesus, my daughter. Like, what just happened? Afterwards, she, he picks her up and gives her and gives Kingsley to Aaron, and Kingsley instantly stops crying. She's instantly better, and then she yawns and she opens her mouth so wide. I'm like, wow, she really did have some tongue tie, a tongue tie and a lip tie. It was amazing. Hey, good news. She's gaining weight now. <laughs> Everything's working out. So that was our first real challenge as parents. We didn't want to do it, but the accomplishment was worth it. And isn't that true about challenges in life? Challenges are thrown at us and it hits us and makes us feel afraid or are we able to do this? Challenges are filled with uncertainty if we're able to or can we? Which leads me to my tweetable thought today. My tweetable thought today is this. Accept the challenge to share God's love to the world. Accept the challenge to share God's love to a world. Talk about a challenge that can kind of sound intimidating, right? See, we all have challenges in our life. We all have things we need to overcome. But here's a truth I learned in my life. Here's a truth I learned in my life, and I want to share with you. You will never live the best life God has for you if you live a life that's focused only on yourself. You will never live the life that God really has for you if it's only focused on yourself. God challenges us to live a life for, other, for others. It's interesting that Jesus says, one of the last things Jesus says to his disciples is to go. It's to go out, to live this life in a way that points people back to him. So, like I said, the idea of sharing my faith, and maybe it's just me, 
sometimes the idea of sharing my faith can sound kind of intimidating, right? Kind of like, man, I don't want to be, you know, that weird, oversaved Christian at work. You know who I'm talking about. You've been around those people a little too saved, you know what I'm saying? So it's kind of like this. The best way you, the best way you can tell you're around someone who's oversaved, somehow they always make everything about the Bible. No matter what you're doing, it's about the Bible. Like, for example, you'll be working out with someone, running, and then you're running. You know, you're doing your thing. At the end of your run, you're like, "Woo, I'm tired. I'm thirsty. Then the oversaved person will say, oh, you're thirsty? Well, I know a man who has living waters. If you drink from him, you'll never thirst again. Do you know Jesus? And you're like, dude, I just want a Gatorade. Why are you going up on me right now? See, I don't think, you, it's funny because you know you met someone like that. That's why it's funny. See, I don't think living for Jesus should make you weird. I don't think sharing God's love is an odd thing. I think sharing the love of God should naturally flow out of your life. If you're living for Jesus, if you believe Jesus has the best life for you, if Jesus has helped you, has healed you, has, has moved you closer to him, it just naturally flows out of you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So today, we're going to look at a character in the Bible. We're going to look at this, real, this really short story in the Bible about a man who had to share his faith. And he was afraid. He didn't want to accept the challenge. we got three points to go along. Okay, check this out. Point number one today is this. Accept the challenge because God believes in you. Yeah. Accept the challenge because God believes in you. Did you know that God believes in you? Did you know God believes in your life? See, often we ask the question, do you believe in God? But I think a better question may be, did you know that God believes in you? That God has a plan for you. God has a purpose for your life and a good one. This is where we find our biblical character today. This is where we find a man named Ananias. Check this out in Acts 9, starting in verse 10, it says this, In Damascus there is a disciple named Ananias. The Lord called to him in a vision, Ananias. Yes, Lord, he answered. The Lord told him to go to the house of Judas on Straight Street and ask for a man named Saul, for he is praying. And in a vision he has seen a man named Ananias come and place his hands on him to restore his sight. So here is a disciple named Ananias. Just minding his business. He's just doing his morning devotionals. And then all of a sudden, Jesus speaks to him. Jesus speaks to him and says, I want you to visit a man named Saul and I want you to restore his sight. But check out the response of Ananias here. Lord, Ananias answered, I have heard many reports about this man and all the harm he has done to your holy people in Jerusalem. And he has come here with authority from the chief priests to arrest all who call on your name. Ananias is like, um, Jesus, come again? Who do you want me to talk to? Who do you want me to share your love with? See, see now to get a better understanding of, of this, we got to understand who Saul is. Now, Saul, he was the Pharisee of the Pharisee. He was a top leader in the Jewish faith. And Saul was aggressively persecuting the early church aggressively persecuting people who followed the way, followed Jesus, persecuting them to the point that theologians believe that Paul was responsible for many murders, including women, women and children. Paul, I mean Saul, is a bad man. Saul is not a good man. And here's the interesting thing about Saul, though. He did it all in the name of God. Saul thought he was doing the right thing. Saul thought he was living his life the right way. And, and this just baffles me sometimes when I think about Christians. Sometimes Christians respond to people who don't know Jesus as if they should know who Jesus is. Sometimes Christians look at the sinful nature of the world and we judge the world from a distance and we say, I can't believe people do this and people do that and I can't believe. But why would we get mad at unchurched people for doing unchurched things? Better, the church needs to step up and be the light to our world, be the light to our community. The show, Living for Jesus, actually brings the best life possible. 
Saul is aggressively persecuting the church until he was on the road to Damascus. Check out, Paul, check, check out Saul's story. It says this, as he neared Damascus on his journey, suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him. He fell to the ground and heard a voice say to him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Who are you, Lord? Saul asked. I am Jesus, who you, who you are persecuting, he replied. Now get up and go to the city, and you will be told what you must do. So Saul has this crazy encounter with Jesus. He's riding on his donkey to go to Damascus, and then Jesus knocks him off of his donkey. And that's a whole other message I can preach about how sometimes Jesus will knock us off of our, mm-hmm, <laughs> to get our attention. Okay, but I'll say that one for another day, okay? <laughs> so, so Saul is a known man and not for a good reason, and Ananias is just his disciple praying. Now, Scripture doesn't tell us much about Ananias. Some theologians believe he is part of the 70 disciples that Jesus sent out earlier, but you can't really find proof for that. Some theologians believe that he was a new convert to the way, but you don't really know. We don't know much about Ananias. The Bible doesn't give us much insight to Ananias. We don't know if he was a great man of faith. We don't know if he had this trust in God or this, this spirit to go after God no matter what. We don't know much about Ananias. Actually, one of the interesting things about Ananias, the name Ananias is one of the most common names in that day. So it kind of says to us, Ananias is just a normal guy. Ananias is just a regular guy. Ananias is just an ordinary guy doing his ordinary life, but part of his ordinary routine, doing his ordinary way of living until Jesus comes and speaks something extraordinary to him. And isn't it interesting, when you read scripture, the Bible is not filled with a whole bunch of extraordinary people doing extraordinary things for God. The Bible is filled with ordinary people who are just available for God to use. And I believe in the core of my heart, in the depths of me, I believe that God does not use the so-called qualified people of this world. But God will use the available people and qualify them for the task that he assigns to them. Here's Ananias, just a normal guy, just a regular guy, doing his normal thing. And you may say today, God wouldn't want to use someone like me. I'm just a normal person. I don't got much to offer. I'm still struggling in my marriage. I'm still struggling with my finances. God wouldn't want to use me. You may say, I'm just a mom. I'm just in the medical field. I'm just a military person. I'm just a student. But, but check out what Jesus says. Because I like to live my life based on the things that Jesus says, not what CNN or Fox News tells me, but what Jesus tells me. And check out what Jesus says. Jesus says in John 14, he says, Very truly I tell you, whoever believes in me will do the works I have been doing. Hold on one second. And they, it continues, and they will do even greater things than these. Wait, 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 wait. Hold on, hold on, hold the door. Hold the door, hold the door. Hold on. You, these things you will do. Let's just recap what he did real fast. This man walked on the water. This man restored sight to the blind. This man healed the sick. This man with one command said the dead to rise. You're telling me, Jesus, all those things I can do too? Yeah. And not only can you do those things, but you can do greater things than those. And so if Jesus is telling you today that you can do greater works than him, then that addiction does not have a hold of you anymore. Then that marriage problem will not get the last word over your family. Then your financial situation is going to change because Jesus says you can do greater things. Oh, come on, I'm preaching too good right now. See? We got to know that Jesus believes in us, point one, accept the challenge because God believes in you. Point two today is this, accept the challenge because God has a crazy, ridiculous, awesome plan for your life to make this world a better place. That's a mouthful. <laughs> accept the challenge because God has a crazy, ridiculous, and awesome plan for your life to make this world a better place. Here is Ananias. God speaks to him, tells him to go see a man named Saul. Ananias is afraid, but God has this crazy, ridiculous, awesome plan for his life. And I want you to see what Ananias does here. 
Jesus gives him an assignment. And Ananias replies with a correction. He said, Jesus, have you heard the reports about this man? He's done all the harm to your people. And he's coming with authority from the chief priest. And this part is kind of hilarious to me. It's kind of funny to me because Ananias, because Jesus gives him a plan. Jesus speaks to him the plan, and Ananias applies to Jesus as if Jesus didn't know who Saul was. <laughs> He's like, Jesus, um, have you checked your Twitter feed recently? Because Saul's been trending, and not for good reasons. <laughs> He's like, He's like, Jesus, have you been on Facebook recently? Or is your timeline just flooded with all the people that share the videos of how to make the food in one minute and they make it look so easy, but really ain't as easy as those videos make it look to be? <laughs> you know what I'm talking about. I tried to. And then turn out the same way. He said, Jesus, have you not seen, have you not heard about this man? Have you not heard? See, I like to think that if I was doing my morning devotionals and then the audible voice of God spoke to me, I would like to think, think I would do whatever the audible voice of God told me to do. I like to think that's what I would do. But, but the truth is this. Jesus does speak to us today. His voice is alive and his voice does speak. And often instead of following the plan that Jesus has for us, we reply back with a correction. We say, Jesus, I know, I know you want me to go back to school. I know you want me to get my degree because I know you have a dream for me. But Jesus, have you heard I got kids? Jesus, have you heard? I got, I got a spouse. I got to work a full-time job. And I know you're God. And I know you, you sent your one and only son, born of a virgin, which is crazy. And that he lived a perfect life who never sinned. And then he died a death for me. And three days later, he miraculously rose from the grave. I know he did all that, but I can never go back to school. Jesus, have you heard the reports? Have you heard, Jesus? Have you heard, Jesus, I'm, I'm single, and I know you got someone out there for me, and I know you're trying to deal with some things on the inside of my heart, but Jesus, have you heard that person gave me attention, and I know they're not good for me, but I keep going back to the people that aren't good for me, and I keep finding myself in the same thing that I know I said I never would do again. Jesus, have you heard? Have you heard, Jesus, I, I know I should go to N.A. or A.A. or get in, a, get in a small group that gets some people around me to help me. But I don't need accountability, Jesus. I'm good. I, I, know, I, I know I need to get a job. I know I need to stop procrastinating. But, Jesus, have you heard? No one's going to hire someone like me. And Jesus will speak to us. He'll give us commands. And we'll respond back with corrections. And could it be, come on, could it be that God has amazing and great plans for our lives? But could it be that his plans for our lives are his preferences? Could it be that the plans for our future, that he has for our future, is that his preferred plan? Could it be that God has a plan for our life, that he's willing to flip heaven upside down for us to achieve? But could it be that God will allow us to live at whatever level we settle for? Could it be that he is a shepherd who expects us to follow? But check this out what it says in the Bible. Ephesians 3 in the massage version, I mean the message version of the Bible says, God can do anything, you know. Oh, I love it. God can do anything, you know, far more than you ever imagined or guessed or requested in your wildest dreams. He does it not by pushing us around, but by working within us, his spirit deeply and gently within us. The question is not if God has crazy, ridiculous, awesome plans for our life. The question is, are you willing to pursue the crazy, ridiculous, awesome plan that God has for your life? Are you willing to pursue it? 
And wherever God sends you, wherever God commissions you, wherever God challenges you, he will connect you with people. If you are living in a place that you're not impacting people, if you're not changing the world, you are not living in the purpose God has for you. Your purpose will always be aligned with making this world a better place. Did you know that God has a purpose for you? And I, and I want you to, to see this. So here Saul encounters Jesus, and, and the Bible says that he's in this strange house. He doesn't know where he is, and he's praying. He's blind, and he's praying. Saul is blind and praying. And while Saul is praying, Ananias is debating. While Saul is praying, Ananias is debating. And did you know that there's people in this world that needs that encouraging word that you can give? There's people at your work. There's people in your family that need you to shine the love of God. There's people all around you that need you to stop gossiping like everybody else. There's people all around you that need what you have. And while we're, and while we're living in excuses, people are praying, hoping that we share what we have. And why? And why we're well, our our Twitter fingers are, are on fire on Facebook talking about all the problems of the world. We ain't doing a dang thing. Just complaining and sharing posts that don't even matter when people read them. Why don't you do something that changes the world? Love somebody. Encourage somebody. Ananias makes these excuses. I love the response of Jesus because when Jesus gives you an excitement, he doesn't back down on that excitement. He says, well, have you heard Jesus? And Jesus replied, he said, go. Jesus doesn't even entertain his excuses. He says, go. This man is my chosen instrument to proclaim my name to the Gentiles and their kings and to, and to proclaim my name to Israel. Point one today is this, accept the challenge because God believes in you. Point two, accept the challenge because God has a crazy, ridiculous, awesome plan for your life to make this world a better place. And my third and my final point today is this, accept the challenge because you never know the God potential inside somebody else. Accept the challenge because you never know the God potential inside somebody else. So Ananias decides to listen to Jesus. He goes to the house, and I can picture him going to the house where Saul is, and he's like, man, I can't believe Jesus got me up here doing these kind of things. I thought when I became a Christian, life became easy. I thought when I became a Christian, life became like unicorns and pretty, pretty pony pictures and things. I had me talking to this crazy man. He's at the door, and he's standing there, and I can picture him standing in the front of the door with Paul inside, lying confused and hoping someone will give him an answer. And I think this is a good picture of our world. Here is Ananias, the man with the good news, and there is Paul, blind and confused, and in between them is a wall. And between them is a wall of fear, a wall of doubt wall of excuses, a wall of, well, God really used me. See, in my house, we love Amazon Prime. My wife loves Amazon Prime too much. <laughs> See, but here's the awesome thing about Amazon Prime. You just go online, you find what you need, you order it, and someone in the magical world of Amazon, I don't even know where this stuff comes from, in the magical world of Amazon, they put our stuff in a box, and then that box goes to a delivery driver, and then that delivery driver brings it to our doorstep, and it's like Christmas every day. <laughs> it's a great feeling. And as I was preparing for this message, as I was thinking about this message, as I was thinking about sharing God's love to the world, I started thinking about what if the Amazon driver decided to hold on to my box? Like he didn't do any of the work. Someone else packed the box. I ordered a box. Someone else packed the box. All he had to do is take the box from A to B. But imagine if he would have held on to the box. And it got me thinking. What if God wants us to be the Amazon delivery drivers to the world? I mean, he did all the work. 
He sent his son. Jesus lived the life that we couldn't live. He died a death that we deserve. He rose from the grave, defeating death. All we got to do is proclaim his message, deliver the box to the world. And I got illustration real fast. I got a fast illustration. Come on, come on out here real fast for me, man. I got someone, I got someone helping me with this illustration. See, see, here is, you can get to my side right over here. Here is Saul. This is the real Saul, too. I paid a lot of money to get the actual Saul to be at church today. <laughs> I'm joking. It's not the real Saul, just in case. Okay, anyways. See, but imagine this. Imagine Ananias, he's at this door. And he's stuck there. And he has this box. He has this message that he's supposed to give Saul. And inside this box is the hope that he needs, is the purpose that he needs, is the plans that he needs. And I'm going to tell you this. God wants you to deliver the box to people around you. Because inside the box where we see fear, it's their, ch it's their faith to change their life. And But this is how we do often. Often we're like, um... Maybe, uh, not to, I can't share. Uh, God doesn't want to use me. I can't do that. Uh, may, oh, no, I ain't going to do that. Texas. Texas, he's lying. It's often we do this too. We look at people and we judge them for what they look like, but not the God potential inside of them. But check this out. Ananias went to the house. Then text says this. And then he entered it. See, you may get to the door, but God needs you to do one more step. He needs you to go inside. He needs you to activate faith. He needs you to accept the challenge because inside the box has the thing that this person needs that will change this world. So, friends, I'm going to encourage you to bust through the door, give someone the box, because when you give them the box, it will take off the blindfold that they have in their life, and they'll be able to open the box, open that box. And inside of the box, is this Word of God. And the Word of God is what changes people, is what brings hope into people, is what gives them a sense of purpose. And when people get the Word of God inside of them, when people get God's message inside of them, it will allow them to become who God has called them to be, the greatest of all time. <laughs> Come on, somebody. Come on, give it up for Damien. Thank you so much. You, you can't keep the shirt. No, nah, that's my shirt. Yeah. Hey, someone get him. Okay, I'm done. <laughs> see, see, then it checks out. Text says this. Text says this. Placed in his hands on Saul, he said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus who appeared to you on the road as you were coming down here has sent me so that you may see again and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Immediately something like scales fell from Saul's eyes and he could see again. He got up and was baptized. See, God uses Ananias to do one of the most significant things in human history. See, and it's so overlooked too. Because Saul would become the Apostle Paul. And the Apostle Paul is responsible for the majority of our New Testament Bible. And the Apostle Paul is responsible for the growth of the early church in the name of Jesus being proclaimed to the, uh, to the ends of the earth. And I'm bothered. Check this out. I want you to go with me here. And I'm bothered to the core because what would have happened if Ananias would have denied the challenge? Theology doesn't teach us that God would send someone else. It doesn't say that God would elect someone else to do it. God had a purpose for Ananias. God had a plan for Ananias. And Ananias' plan was to bring out the God potential in someone else. So friends, I throw out to you today, maybe God has placed some people around you. Maybe God has placed some people in your family that are hard to love. Maybe God has put that coworker around you that drives you a little crazy. But maybe God has a plan for their life that will change this world forever. And God wants to use you to do something significant. God wants to use you to change this world. Friends, Jesus says, all authority in heaven and earth has been given to him. Therefore, go, meaning wherever he sends you, he'll never leave you by yourself. Friends, accept the challenge to share God's love to the world. Bow your heads with me. Let's pray. 
God, we thank you for this challenge. We thank you that you believe in us, God. We thank you that you have a plan for our lives. She may be in here today, and I feel like there's some people in here today. They're struggling with this idea that God will actually believe in them. You're struggling with the idea that God believes in you. You said, no one else has believed in me. People in my family, people have declined me, denied me. No one believes in me. You tell me God believes in me. Maybe saying, I've made too many mistakes. There's no way that God would want to use someone like me. And I want you to know he went to the cross because he loves you. He went to the cross because he believes in you. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son. That whoever believes in him shall never perish but have everlasting life. He believes in you. He has a plan for you. And you're saying, I don't know this crazy, ridiculous, awesome plan, Pastor Jacob. It sounds too far out there. God really wants to use me. Yes, he does. He has set in your heart the ability to change the world. Don't let fear, don't let doubt. Mm, how do you feel right now? Don't let their struggling marriage. Yep. Don't let the don't let the struggles in your life stop you from pursuing God. Use your fears as motivation to activate faith. God, may we see people the way you see them. May we see people with eyes of compassion and love. May we see people the same way you see us as a child of yours. You may be in here today, you like, Pastor Jacob, that sounds good, but I don't know this Jesus you're talking about. I never made a decision to trust Jesus with my life, or maybe you have made that decision and things got in the way, and you're saying right now, I want to make a decision to trust Jesus again with my life. If that's you, I'm going to have you say a prayer with me right at your chair. I'm not going to call you out, raise your hand, have you come up front, nothing like that. Just right where you are. I want you to say this prayer with me. If you want to make a decision to trust Jesus with your life, just repeat after me to say, Jesus, forgive me for my sins. Make me new. Today I trust in you. Today I receive you as my Savior. Today I follow you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Let's give God some praise in here. Man, he's so good. Thanks for tuning in to today's message. If God is impacting your life through this ministry, join us in reaching others by investing today. You can give by texting your donation amount to 757-230-2110 or by going to vineyardchurch.com slash give. Also, don't forget to subscribe to our channel so that you never miss an update. We'll see you next week.